you will take your order of worship. There is a responsive reading there. If you've come to hear good singing, if you've come to hear good preaching, then I hope you'll go away disappointed. Because that's not why we're here. I hope you're not here just to hear something. I hope you're here to worship. Stand together as we read God's Word, please. I'll read the light print if you will follow with the dark print. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. Now, our God, we give thanks to you. Continue in your worship guide. Oh, come, let us adore him. Use this time to prepare your hearts to sort of let the dust settle on all that's happened this morning. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Christ the Lord, we'll praise His name forever. there be glory and honor and praises, glory and honor to Jesus, glory and honor, glory and honor to Him. Once again, please. Let there be glory and honor and praises, glory and honor to Jesus, glory and honor, glory and honor to Him. Worship His Majesty unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, Kingdom authority. From his throne unto his own, his anthems raise. So exalt, lift 
upon high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Majesty, worship His majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Wow! What a line! Jesus who died, now glorified. What an amazing thing God has done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ, of giving us the living illustration of how He works in our life. It is only when we die that we truly live. It is in the aftermath of our greatest struggles and our greatest heartaches that God unleashes our greatest joys and our greatest blessings. And what you and I know every time we hit a rough spot in the road, Every time one of those New Orleans potholes ends up in our life, what we know is that it's a springboard. And the difference between a springboard and a diving platform is the springboard goes down so that it can propel you where? Up. And every crisis and challenge we have is God's springboard. He lets us go down as life gets hard sometimes. But it is always and only for the purpose of sending you where? Up. Isn't that a great line? Jesus who died, now glorified. Mike Garrett, our librarian, would you please lead us in a word of prayer? And amen. Now, before you sit down, turn to somebody next to you and just remind them, your potholes are God's springboards. Would you do that? <laughs> amen. Thank you so much. We welcome you to chapel today, and we are so delighted that you could be with us. It's a very special weekend in the life of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. One of the most important things that ever happens in the life of a minister is that he and his wife both together have a sense of calling. Many of your wives did not marry preachers. They did not know what God was going to call you to do when they said, I do. And one of the most important things that happens in seminary life is not simply the training and education and preparation of that man who's called to pastor or preach or do whatever God calls you to do, but it is also the assimilating of a marriage to be a ministry-based marriage. There's some different tensions and different dynamics in the life and marriage of ministers than you find in other marriages. Many things are the same, some are different. For that reason, our seminary has always emphasized for many years the importance of your wives having a great seminary experience in addition to you having some great classes. One of the ladies who championed that from the very first day she set foot on this campus as president's wife was Mrs. Joanne Level, the wife of our former president, Dr. Landrum P. Level II. She's had such a passion for student wives. The very first fall she was here, she began teaching a class on being a minister's wife, uh, how to be married to a minister that is still offered today. Every fall it comes around, it was her class by design. She has such a burden for student wives. She started an endowment fund for needy student wives that lets us take, we call the student 
aid office, the financial aid office, we get the names of some of our families who are in the most dire financial circumstances, and several times a year, we're able to take the money from the endowment Mrs. Level raised and take one of our student wives shopping. Just last year, my wife took one of our student wives shopping, and it was the first time in more than 13 years that particular wife had a new piece of clothing. Also a part of Mrs. Level's wonderful legacy for student wives is the Level Lecture Weekend. For the Level family has established a, a special retreat event for student wives. It takes place this weekend. And guys, you need to go home immediately and you need to check on your wives and be sure that your wife is planning to be a part because this is all a, pro a part of the process for helping your wife understand you and become as passionately committed to ministry as you are. A participant in raising that endowment for the Student Wife Clothing Fund and for the Level Lecture Fund is Margaret Mann, uh, Mrs. Dr. Level's sister. And she and Mrs. Level are both here today. These two ladies love your wives even though they've never met them. And they love you. And they have played such a critical role in the life of our seminary and in reminding our seminary, hey, don't just worry about the guys. These guys have families. And those families are important too. I know you would want to say a word of appreciation to them. Mrs. Level, would you and Margaret please stand and let us give you some affirmation. Thanks. We are delighted to have with us in chapel Dr. John Sullivan. His wife, Nancy, will be speaking for the Level Lectures this weekend. She also has a great passion for ministers' wives. As a matter of fact, she herself has helped to raise an endowment to subsidize the cost of an event every year at the Southern Baptist Convention when they do a luncheon for ministers' wives to, again, give those ladies an opportunity to fellowship with each other, network with each other. Nancy has a great passion for ministers' wives. Her husband, John, is currently serving as secretary, executive secretary of the Florida Baptist Convention. In the history of our seminary, we have rarely had a friend of this seminary that has been as good a friend as Dr. John Sullivan. He will point to one great tragic error in his life. He went to the wrong seminary. But God called him to Louisiana to be the pastor of Broadmoor Baptist Church. And this alumnus of another seminary said when he came to Louisiana, I am going to adopt New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary as my seminary. Now he encouraged his church to be the largest pace-setting church and cooperative program giving, underwriting the ministry of our seminary for all the years he was a pastor here in Louisiana. And right now, the Florida Baptist Convention is one of our largest cooperative program supporting states. He has always been a big supporter of that cooperative program, for he knows it undergirds the work of our seminaries and our missionaries. But he did more than that, more than that basic general giving. He also led his church to do something no church, to my knowledge, had ever done before in Southern Baptist life. He led his church to give our seminary an endowed chair of discipleship. Dr. Perry Hancock is the Broadmoor Chair of Discipleship. And our program of spiritual mentoring, where our first-year students uh, gather together in a group of about six to eight students, meet with a faculty member for a year to walk with God together with a faculty member, all of that is made possible because of the endowment that came from Broadmoor Baptist Church while Dr. John Sullivan was the pastor of that church. When he went to Florida, he continued his relationship with our school. And he has been absolutely instrumental in us being able to offer extension center education all over the state of Florida for his great passion is for preachers to have an opportunity to get training so that they might be better prepared for the work God has called them to do. Every kind of way someone could indicate they love seminary students, they believe in theological education, and they particularly want to help and support New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Dr. John Sullivan has done. He is a rare friend indeed. That is why this year our seminary did something we've done extremely rarely in our past. We declared Dr. John Sullivan to be an honorary alumnus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. We've taken him into the fold. Dr. Sullivan, in addition to all of that, is a fabulous witness, a fabulous preacher. He's been so active, I could spend the rest of the time giving you the list of things that he has done for the Lord in our denomination and in his ministry. But his very most favorite thing to do is to preach the Word of God. So I'm just warning you. Get your Bibles ready. Get your hand loose, because you'll have some good notes to take, and you'll have to write fast. 
He will preach with great passion and great power. And He always has a word from the Lord for us. So let's join our hearts and worship together for another time of worship. And then we'll hear from Dr. John Sullivan. Hymn 202. All hail the power of Jesus' name. It's a hymn arrangement. So near the end, we'll be repeating the last phrase of the fourth, fourth verse several times. Stand with me, if you will, please. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Win forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him. Chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saved you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saved you by his grace, and crown him. On this terrestrial ball, to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. With him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord. That with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall, we'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the Sing song and crown him and crown him again and crown him and crown him Lord and crown him Lord of all and crown him Lord of all and crown him Lord of all. Thank you. Be seated.
Well, thank you so very much for the joy of being here and having this time to share with you a very special blessing to my life this morning. Uh, my director of business services, Steve Bumgardner, and his wife Paula are in this service. I walked into the chapel this morning, and there they were. Uh, I didn't know they were coming, but somehow they knew I was coming, and they're here for a meeting. Steve and Paula, stand up. Thank you for being here today. God bless you. Came all the way from Jacksonville just to hear me preach. Now, Steve's no dummy. He knows this is the month of evaluations, and I'm the one that evaluates him. And he's a smart boy. Thank you, Dr. Kelly, for those kind words. I am indeed grateful to New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. I have no better friend in this world than Dr. Landrum Level. And Dr. Level and I believe in what's happening here as well as a lot of other people around the world. I believe in the cooperative program of the Southern Baptist Convention. And I've staked my life on it. And I will continue to stake my life on it. Let me tell you, seminary students, it doesn't matter who does what. God's going to take care of New Orleans Seminary. You can put that down and take it to God's bank and deposit it. I am fully convinced that the cooperative program is God-given and missions-driven. And as long as we know that and remember that, it's not a matter of survival. It's a matter of growth. Today I want to talk to you about one of the most interesting subjects I've come upon in a long time. I am always frustrated when I cannot find what I'm looking for. Just about this time last year, I was going through one of those frustrating times because everything I picked up to read and everything I heard was how to get on the cutting edge. Now, most of the time they were talking about technology. Sometimes they were talking about organization. Now, for me, high tech is when my yellow pad is already pre-punched. Now, that's high tech for me. I am not into computers. I make no bones about it. I know they are a valuable tool, but students, let me tell you, you're not going to win the world to Jesus Christ with computers. You can become so high tech and low touch that you miss people who hurt so badly that they have forgotten all of the ways they hurt. You have to get out there where they are and flesh to flesh let them know that Jesus Christ is the Savior and Lord of your life and you have good news. He can change their life. So I was a bit frustrated trying to find this thing of the cutting edge finally found it. I want to tell you about it today. Hebrews chapter 1. And then one verse from the book of Colossians, 127. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. This now then is the Word of God. God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom He made the world, who being in the brightness of His glory and the expressed image of His person, upholding all things by the word of His power, when he had purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels as he hath and in, by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Colossians 1.27 To whom God made known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Here it is. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of glory. Sometimes when you're searching for something, you can become confused about the entire process. That's where I was on this thing of the cutting edge. I, I felt a little like the boy that came in and said to his dad, Dad, where did I come from? 
And his father had been waiting for that day to answer all of the questions of his son's adolescent life. And, and so he got out his charts and he got out his sex education speech. And for about an hour he said, now son, this is how it is. This is where you came from. And when he got through, he said to the little boy, now does that answer your question? He said, no, not really. He said, Billy Jones said, he's from Arkansas. I just wanted to know where I'm from. Where did I come from? And so you get confused when you're searching for answers to situations and to difficulties. I was trying to find out something about this cutting edge. Sometimes I came that close. Sometimes I missed it entirely. And at other times I didn't care. But I was searching. I was looking. What am I after? And then three things converged in my life within a month's time. Three things within a month's time. And they just converged. I was in a revival meeting at the First Baptist Church of Winter Park, Florida, and we were having an after-church fellowship, cookies and Kool-Aid, the whole enchilada. And we were back in that gymnasium, and it was full. I mean, it was full. It was packed out. Here I was with a cup of coffee in one hand and a cookie in the other hand, and in the midst of visiting with other people, this lady came up to me with this young lady by her side, and she said, I believe this young lady wants to ask you how to be saved. I said, well, that's fine. I can quit doing whatever I'm doing to tell her how to come to know the faith and come to faith in Jesus Christ. So I put down my coffee and my cookie in her broken English. She was from Venezuela. In her broken English, she tried to tell me what she needed in my life. And in my non-Spanish, I told her how to be saved. At the end of that, I said to her, would you like for this to happen in your life? And she said, oh yes, I've been waiting for someone to tell me. With all of those people and all of that hubbub that goes on in an after-church fellowship, we bowed our heads and she prayed to receive Christ as her Lord and Savior. About that same time, I was involved in another revival meeting in not a large church. In fact, it was a very small church. It's, it's one of those churches that you just wonder, how long has it been since God's been here? Now, I know you don't have to deal with those kind of churches, but I do. How long since God paid a visit? I knew the church by history, by reputation, but they had a fine, handsome, young, just out of seminary graduate and his wife. They were so excited. This was their first church. Two beautiful children beautiful lady, handsome young man, and they were so excited. And I tried to remember back to my first church, and it just simply regenerated my excitement for him being in the first place God is going to let him be the pastor. And he said, now things are going to happen this week. I didn't want to dampen his optimism. I just simply said, let's pray to that end. On the second night of the revival, a lady came in, in a wheelchair. Diabetes. Diabetes had taken both legs. When I saw her come in, there was an empathy that immediately connected with her. I don't know why. I watched the struggle as she got from the chair to the pew. I watched her all during the service. I was absolutely focused on that woman. And going through my mind was this question. How long did it take her to get ready to come to church? How long will it take her without any help to get back home Get ready for bed. She was there every night. 
At the same time, there was a Hispanic family. The church had finally awakened to the fact this community is changing. If we're going to reach our community, it's going to include the Hispanics. And this young lady came and said, I'm, I'm praying for my husband. There was such intensity and sincerity. I covenanted with her that I would pray for her husband that week. On Wednesday night, that handsome young Hispanic man came down the aisle and took the pastor by the hand and accepted Christ as the Lord and Savior of his life in the midst of all of the language barrier, in the midst of all of the cultural context, in the midst of all of that in this small rural church in the state of Florida. And the church rejoiced. It was almost as wonderful as seeing the man saved to watch the church rejoice. It had finally broken through. The gospel is for all men everywhere. It is not a white middle class Anglo-Saxon gospel. And it can overcome every culture and every language barrier known to man. He was gloriously and wonderfully saved. And the entire family started coming, just gathering around him. About that same time, I went to Haiti to preach a revival and to attend the National Conference of the Confederation of Haitian Baptists. Florida Baptists have started churches in Haiti for the last six years. In six years, Florida Baptists have started almost 600 churches in the island nation of Haiti. I was going down as an encourager. I was going down to speak at the crusade. I don't speak French. I was speaking through an interpreter. On the last night of that crusade, which was Sunday night, I was not prepared for what happened. I was not prepared for what took place. I stood to preach in a torrential downpour. I, I mean, it was a frog strangler of a rain. It was coming down in sheets, and before I ever got up to preach, there was probably two inches of rain on the field. Thirty-seven thousand people stood in the rain two hours to hear me preach. It was one of the most moving experiences of my life because I knew they were not there because I was preaching. They were there because there was a hunger in their soul for something more in life. I can't meet all of the social needs of Haiti. I can't even meet all of the spiritual needs of Haiti. But I gave them the thing that would meet the best need of their life. I told them about Jesus Christ, and a thousand of them came to know Him that night. I wasn't ready for that. I got back home and I started contemplating on the three things that had taken place in my life in quick succession as I'd been looking for the cutting edge and it seemed as if God said to me, Hello, you found it. Here's the cutting edge. Christ in you is the cutting edge. I will never be on the cutting edge of technology. I will never be on the cutting edge of organization. But if I can be on the cutting edge of a positive walk with Jesus Christ, who lives in me, I am on the cutting edge. And if I miss that, nothing else matters. If I miss that, it is all to no avail. If I miss that edge, Christ in you is the hope of glory. As God opened my understanding. As I look into the Word of God and try to put together all that he was saying here in the book of Hebrews and just happened at that time that I was reading through in my devotional time the book of Hebrews and it just happened 
just happened? Oh, no, I don't think so. I think God took those three experiences and matched them together with my devotional life. And out of the book of Hebrews, He started speaking to me about the cutting edge of life. In this cutting edge of life, Christ in you as the hope of glory is this Christ that has been described by the Hebrew writer. If anyone had been pushed to the edge, it had been those Hebrews that had been converted. These were converted Hebrews who had turned from everything they had ever known. They had turned from the commandments. They had turned from the law. They had turned from the Pharisees and the religious leaders and had taken Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. This is written to converted Hebrews. This is also written to convicted Hebrews. They had repented because Simon Peter said, You have crucified the Lord of glory. Repent! These were convicted Hebrews who were cut to the soul. These were convinced Hebrews who believed that the promise of the Old Testament was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. They were on the cutting edge of redemption. They were on the cutting edge of what it meant to follow Jesus Christ. I look in the Scripture and I look in the Old Testament and I have to confess to you as I read through the Old Testament, sometimes I want to say I don't understand the judgment of God in the Old Testament. I don't understand the judgment of God in the Old Testament. I I don't understand the wrath of God in the Old Testament. And then I come to the New Testament and I read and I said, Oh dear God, I don't understand the love of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. I don't understand how He could love me this much. I don't understand how He could come into this world. I don't understand how He could be the Son of God who came to the glory of this earth from the glory to Golgotha. It's a long trip from glory to Golgotha. And Jesus came for one reason and He shares that reason. He is God's last word. God has spoken. God has spoken. Let me say to you three or four things and then come to the conclusion of the cutting edge. God spoke, the Hebrew writer says. God spoke. Pastor, pastor's wife, you had better latch on to that. There'll be Monday mornings. That's all you'll have. That's all you'll have. There'll be Monday mornings that the only thing that keeps you in the work is that God spoke. And I don't have a choice. If you imagine that you're on a career track, you'd better forget that language. You're not on a career track. You're on a call. You've been to the bush. God has spoken. God spoke in the Old Testament. He spoke to Abraham. Henry Blackaby is absolutely on target when he says that God spoke to Abraham so many times and changed his life so often that finally by the experience he can speak of Abraham as my friend. He had shaped his life with every mistake. Abraham went back to the place. With every mistake, Abraham went back to the call of God. With every mistake, Abraham was shaped. He never argued with God. He may be disobedient, but he never did argue with God because he knew in the ultimate analysis, God spoke. Seminary wives, you better latch on to that. Nancy and I have been in this work together now, and I mean literally together. Never been a question. We've been in this work together now for over 44 years. Preaching the gospel. Depending upon Baptist people. Oh, I've been where you are. I've been where you are. And the truth of the matter is, you'll look back and thank God where you are today. Dr. Kelly's right. Potholes are springboards. Wives, you'll pay the greatest price for your husband's ministry. Not your husband. Not your husband. Somebody asked me, I hope you go to the conference and get to know my Nancy. Well, the most, if you can't love Nancy, you have a real problem. Somebody asked me how we've been able to go 
11 and one half years of theological education without missing a semester and four summers. How have you done it? How have you stayed together? How have you enjoyed the ministry together? I said, it's very simple. We have a simple rule. I don't try to run her life, and I don't try to run my life. Very simple rule. It works every time. God has spoken. He spoke to Abraham. He spoke to Moses at the bush and said, Moses, Moses, I know your name. He spoke to Elijah in the mouth of the cave and said, Elijah, it's not always in the earthquake. It's not always in the storm. Sometimes it's in the still, small voice that God speaks. Don't always wait for the traumatic moments of life. Don't always wait for the storm for God to speak. Listen for the still, small voice of God that says, it's time and you know that it's time. This is what you need to do, that still, small voice of God. Don't let all of your ministry build be built on trauma. Don't let all of your ministry be built on the unfortunate. Let some of your ministry be built on that time with God when simply alone with God you heard Him say, this is what I want you to do with your life and this is where I want you to go. He spoke to Isaiah in the year that Isaiah died. He said, I saw the Lord and His presence filled the place and the post of the doors moved as if God were saying, He Isaiah, if you wonder at all of my power and my glory, let me move these posts just to show you I can enlarge the place and I can fill even more space than I've ever filled before. The posts moved. And Isaiah wasn't hallucinating. The post moved. He spoke to Isaiah. He spoke to Hosea in the home. Go by her back. But God, you don't understand. You don't understand what this woman has done to me. And now she's on the auction block. Go by her back. God spoke. Hosea followed the will of God. Well, the last word. God has spoken. God spoke and God has spoken. For the last time, God has spoken as far as redemption is concerned. Jesus Christ is God's last will and testament to all of our lives. He is that one who is the heir of all of the promises of God. He is the owner. He is the owner. Jesus was in eternity long before He was in the arms of Mary. Jesus was a promise before He ever became a pilgrim. Jesus was in the throne room long before He went to the upper room. Jesus was in a borrowed womb before He ever got to the borrowed tomb. Jesus Christ, in the beginning with the Father, heaped up the hills and scooped out the valleys and stood on nothing. And by His Word, something was made from nothing. And God said, that's good. And then He took the dust of that something and put it together and created a man and breathed into that man life, and God said, that's good. And then He took part of that man and created a woman, and Adam said, that's good. God made. God created. God has spoken. He is the heir of all promises. He is the brightness of the glory of God. He is the Shekinah of God. He is the expressed image of God's presence. He is the sustainer of God's creation. Now listen, student, what I'm saying to you. Listen to this man, Jesus, the last will and testament, the last will and testimony of God to man as far as redemption is concerned. Here he is. He is the brightness of God's glory. He is the expressed image of God's presence. He is the sustainer of God's creation. He is the redeemer of lost souls. There is no co-redeemer in Jesus Christ. It is not Jesus plus someone or Jesus plus a church. It is Jesus and Jesus alone who redeems us out of our lostness and saves us for eternity. He is the last word. In His birth is our significance. In His life is our example. In His death is our salvation. In His resurrection is our hope. In His coming again is our victory. That's Jesus, the Christ. And Christ in us is the hope of glory. 
you want to get on the cutting edge, Christ in you. That's the cutting edge. You want to be on the cutting edge of ministry, Christ in you. You want to be on the cutting edge of missions, Christ in you. You want to be on the cutting edge of education, Christ in you. You want to be on the cutting edge of leadership, Christ in you. You want to be on the cutting edge of relationship, Christ in you. You want to be on the cutting edge of pastoral ministry, Christ in you. You want to be on the cutting edge of preaching, Christ in you. That's the cutting edge. That's the cutting edge. No matter where else you go, no matter what else you do, as the called of God, if you don't find that cutting edge, it won't matter. Just stand for a closing word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we would never dream of leaving an unopened Christmas present under the tree. But oh, how easy it is for us to be so distracted by the world. We leave unopened the potential of Christ in us. Oh, how I pray that you would take these words shared today and use them to stir our hearts and give us the deepest longing of our souls to know You and be known by You, and to let the Christ in us do absolutely everything He wants us to do. Prepare our hearts, Father, to be a royal throne for that Christ who will see in our every action and our every word obedience, loyalty, and dedication. In the precious and the strong name of Jesus we pray. Amen.